rice is the daily sustenance of more human beings than any other food. But in most of the Far East, the manner of its cultivation is unchanged from that ancient time when man discovered that this remarkable plant can grow submerged underwater. These primitive methods are inefficient, wasteful of human energy. Can modern science help these people grow more rice? Two American foundations think that it can. dedication ceremonies early in 1962 came Mr. Diosdado Macapagal, President of the Philippines, where the Institute is located, Mr. John D. Rockefeller III, Dr. F. F. Hill, the Ford Foundation, Dr. George Harar, President of the Rockefeller Foundation. The distinguished guests were welcomed by Dr. Robert F. Chandler of the Rockefeller Foundation, Director of the Institute. Around the central plaza are the research center buildings, library, dormitory, greenhouses, a service building, laboratories. Close to the research center are the plots of the experimental farm diked and with an irrigation system planned for ultra-precise control. In the experimental plots, the life cycle of the rice plant can be studied under the same natural conditions as it grows in the farmer's paddy. Preparation of the soil with modern machinery is being studied in comparison with traditional motive power, the ill-tempered water buffalo. The experimental plots are planted carefully and precisely in order to gather data about the best spacing between plants and rows and about other cultivation practices, such as the use of fertilizers, an important key to increase production. Experimental weed control is with these rotary hoes. And the effectiveness of various sprays for protection against insects and diseases. In the four greenhouses, the rice plants can be grown under controlled temperature conditions and closely observed, as in this study of resistance to a deadly disease of rice. The entomologist can inoculate a plant with disease-carrying insects and watch them at their destructive work. Six plant growth chambers provide more completely controlled growing conditions so that day length and humidity as well as temperature can be varied and held within close limits. The end result of much research, the seed from a single experimental plant. The Institute's laboratories are probably the best in Southeast Asia. 
In the chemistry section, the plants are dried in an electric oven and ground up so they can be intensively studied for nitrogen metabolism, for the synthesis of starch, for the biochemistry of disease resistance, for grain quality, for amino acid content, and for other factors that govern yield and nutritional value. physiology section studies the physical processes and growth of the rice plant. The entomologists, starting with the larvae of insects like the stem borer, rear them in the laboratory in order to study their life cycles and how to control their depredations in the field. A scientist who specializes on rice must be willing to get his hands dirty and his feet wet. For field and laboratory studies must supplement each other. Here a pathologist observes infections of blast, the most important disease of rice. In the laboratory, microscopic analysis extends the observations. Batteries of machines supply air conditioning, steam, compressed air, demineralized and distilled water, and other essential laboratory services. In the service building are complete facilities for repairing equipment and for making experimental implements and tools. The Institute's Library and Documentation Center offers researchers and students one of the world's best collections of technical literature on rice. An associated publications and conference program will make the Institute a center for dissemination of new knowledge about rice. In the dormitory facing the central plaza are dining facilities for staff and research fellows in training. quarters for 60 research fellows. Through 
seminars and through participation in field and laboratory research directed by senior staff scientists, the Institute offers unparalleled opportunities for advanced training experience in rice improvement. If the rice bowl countries are to grow more rice, they urgently need many more highly qualified agricultural scientists. They need higher yielding, disease resistant varieties and information about their management. The Institute and its staff are dedicated to the gathering of new knowledge about the rice plant and to the advanced level training of rice specialists for all the rice bowl countries. Any one of Robert Chandler's accomplishments makes him a leading international figure. Agricultural scientist, professor, horticulturist, university president, soil scientist, institute director, consultant, and world-renowned expert on food production, especially rice. Rice is one of the world's most important crops. Over two billion people depend on it for their staple food. But throughout much of the 20th century, rice yields were low and stagnant. As populations rose, there were shortages, and even the most productive rice-producing countries had to import rice to feed their people. In the late 50s, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation joined forces to work on this problem. Their mandate was to increase rice production. In 1960, they formed the International Rice Research Institute, known as IRI. It was located in the Philippines, just outside Manila in Los Baños, adjacent to the College of Agriculture. Dr. Robert Chandler, who had become an authority on rice when he traveled throughout Asia for the Rockefeller Foundation, was chosen as the first director. Dean Rusk was president of the Rockefeller Foundation at the time. Well, I saw a man who uh, was able to roll up his sleeves and work in the fields and in the laboratories with uh, his colleagues. I saw a man who was uh, skilled at uh, organizing research to achieve the purposes which, which they were trying to uh, bring about. Um, he was uh, agreeable, warm-hearted, uh, easy to work with. Uh, he, uh, he was just the ideal man for the spot. Bob Chandler grew up on a farm in Maine. He was one of six children, and they're still a close family today. After earning a B.S. from the University of Maine and a Ph.D. from the University of Maryland, he joined academia, first as a professor at Cornell, then at the University of New Hampshire, as Dean of the College of Agriculture, and later as President of the University. As Director of Erie, Dr. Chandler oversaw the building of the labs and the clearing of land for the experimental fields. He chose the staff and the team of scientists, and they got to work immediately. We are wondering why it is that rice yields are so low, and we have already found here at the Institute that it is possible to get as much as six times the national average here in the Philippines of rice by treating it correctly. They crossed short varieties of rice from Japan and Taiwan with local tall rices. They dealt with the effects of fertilizers, irrigation, climate, sunlight, diseases, insects, and other predators. Bob and his team, uh, I'm sure he'd want to give credit to his team, uh, they conquered all of those in a, in, a, in a simple way that could be followed by simple farmers throughout the Orient. He was enthusiastic, he had the vision, he was a uh, boundless energy, uh, and he knew what he was about to try to do, and he, and he knew how he was going to try to do it. And believe me, it's not easy to take a, an international group of scientists and administrators and people who speak different languages and come from different cultures, totally different cultures, and weld them into a, an operative team that's going to really uh, do a difficult thing that's never been done before. In just a few years, they took a six-foot rice plant that would fall over in the water and rot and bred it into a sturdy three-foot plant. They shortened the growing period from 200 days to 130 and later down to 105 days. This new rice plant was resistant to insects and disease and needed less daylight. The first major step forward was a rice they called IR-8. With it, Bob Chandler and his team revolutionized Asia's rice crop, tripling the yield potential. And that was a big change, and that opened up whole new vistas for the rice farmer in Asia. The germplasm, or seeds, of this new variety were sent to over 80 countries worldwide. More and more farmers began to grow it and see a difference. The world began to look toward Erie, 
and world leaders recognized its importance. President Lyndon Johnson stopped there in 1965. If we are to win our war, and the only important war that really counts, if we are to win our war against poverty and against disease and against ignorance and against illiteracy and against hungry stomachs, then we have got to succeed in projects like this. And you are pointing the way for all of Asia to follow. World Bank had Robert McNamara paid a visit, as did Queen Beatrix of Holland and UN Secretary U Tant. Because of Erie, countries like India, Indonesia, and the Philippines, which at one time had had to import rice, became self-sufficient and now even export rice. Without Erie, the fate of Asia might have been very different. Dr. Chandler's achievements and those of Erie can best be measured by what did not happen. The new rice technology averted the time of famines. Miracles happened at Erie while Bob Chandler was its director, and it's for this work at Erie that he is being awarded the General Foods World Food Prize. Bob Chandler retired from Erie in 1972 when he turned 65, but age has never slowed him down. He went from Los Banos right to Taiwan to become the first director of the Asian Vegetable Research and Development Center. Again, he changed plant types and made significant changes in food production. Bob and his wife, Sunny, divide their time these days between a house in Florida and a farm in Maine. They travel, and Bob still consults and writes on agricultural issues. Growing things to their full potential is in Bob's veins. He's turned his attention to pumpkins now. 427 pound pumpkins that win contests for miles around. Those who know Dr. Robert Chandler and his work believe he is more than deserving of the General Foods World Food Prize. I'm glad that they're finally catching up with you and giving you a big prize. I'm sure you'll spend it wisely and for good. And that uh, I hope you take enormous satisfaction uh, from what was accomplished and from the fact that there are millions and millions of people out there eating better today because you were able to do something with rice that hadn't been done since the days it began. Um, I'm on an airplane and uh, Bob, all I can say is that uh, knowing you, working with you, having been inspired by you, uh, was really a, uh, an immense experience. I'm only sorry I'm not with you now. Bob, we uh, are very proud of you and draw deep satisfaction from the work that you've accomplished in your lifetime, particularly as director of the the National Rice Research Institute in the Philippines, which in fact is a monument to you. And uh, we congratulate you on that and extend you our very best wishes. Asia was desperate for food after World War II. Only massive shipments of imported grain was averting famine. Demographers and economists widely predicted that population would outstrip food production so much in the developing nations that the 1970s would be a time of famines. In 1960, the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations pooled their resources to start a global agricultural research center through which scientists from all nations could work as teams to help farmers grow more of the world's most vital crop. The International Rice Research Institute, or IRI, the first of 16 international agricultural research centers today. The headquarters for this bold new initiative would be in Los Banos, Philippines, about 60 kilometers south of Manila. Heading the rice breeding program at Erie would be Dr. Peter Jennings, an enthusiastic young scientist that Rockefeller Foundation had earlier assigned to a rice program in Colombia. And Peter Jennings had been down before he went to South America. He spent um, several months 
Beaumont to become, get acquainted with the, the rice plant and what the problems were. In 1962, Peter Jennings brought Hank to the Philippines to help develop strategies for eliminating hunger. They agreed that the main constraint to rice yields in Asia was, like in Texas, the tall structure of the rice plant. Peter Jennings shared Hank's enthusiasm for developing a semi-dwarf rice. He led a team that dusted pollen from Dijawu Jin, a dwarf rice from China, onto the panicles of Peta, a tall, vigorous variety from Indonesia, hoping to initiate the development of a semi-dwarf rice plant. In 1963, Hank Beechel made a move that would change his life and the lives of hundreds of millions of rice farmers and consumers in the developing countries. Hank accepted a position as rice breeder at Erie. Texas farmers didn't want Hank to leave. And I told some of my rice farmer friends that I thought I could help them more by going to Asia and bringing back new information than I could by staying at home. And there was always the dream of the semi-dwarf rice. And uh, uh, that uh, did, was brought about by the fact that we couldn't find a dwarf gene. I hadn't found the gene here, and it was absolutely essential in the next step. Leaving Texas was hard for the transplanted Nebraskan. Very difficult because I had so many friends here. My wife was, had many friends in Beaumont, and, and to go overseas for the first time while uh, living, uh, I still remember when we were driving up the barrios on both sides of the road right before we got into Erie. I said, God, am I going to be living here for the next <laughs> 10 years? But it was, uh, that was all forgotten. The rice was important and, and uh, it was a good decision. And then simultaneously, Hank took American varieties back to Asia when he moved to Asia, and they became the foundation of some of the Erie releases. So there was a lot of germplasm movement that went with the Hank Beechel story. But when I got to Asia, the first two years was uh, very difficult. Variety names meant nothing, and uh, it just concentrating on, because uh, I did quite a bit of traveling those early years to uh, get acquainted in different countries to find about something about the germplasm and what the problems were. By late 1966, Hank Beechel's dream was about to come true. He and his colleagues had selected a semi-dwarf progeny from Erie's eighth cross of the dwarf plant from China with the tall rice from Indonesia. Its strong stems held the plant proudly upright even when heavily fertilized. And that allowed it to yield bountifully. The new rice was also non-sensitive to day length, so farmers anywhere could grow it at any time of the year. But poor grain quality was a drawback. <laughs> so did you eat IR8 when you released it? Yes, I, I was foolish enough to eat it, yes. But I wanted to eat it right after it came out of the pot. I didn't want it to sit around anyway. Sat around a while, but it got uh, hard and re retrograde and it did scratch your throat. <laughs> but it, Cooking quality was secondary. Milling quality was secondary. The main thing was, was rice, production. But famine loomed in the developing countries. It didn't take long to under realize that the uh, social economic situation uh, was, was critical and uh, as had been uh, uh, predicted in, that there was going to be famine in Asia within the next 20 to 30 years unless we had some drastic changes in methods of producing rice. And uh, so the, the challenge was there to what could we do about it as scientists living there. Feeding people was more important than grain quality. Erie released the revolutionary rice variety to farmers as IR8. The rugged semi-dwarf changed world rice production forever. With good management, the new semi-dwarf rice could yield four, five, even six tons per hectare on fields where farmers had harvested one or two tons for centuries. The immediate decision was, we'll spread that seed to everybody we can. And in the Philippines, we, I think it was a, about one kilo of seed <clears throat> was distributed in one program to everybody that, that wanted it. We had a very free distribution. 
and the minute we found something good, we told the people about it. We distributed it to every country in the, in, in the, all over Asia. But if something that worked, it, it moved very fast. And uh, just overnight, practically, you saw these fields that were planted to uh, the high-yielding varieties. The press soon called the remarkable transformation of Asian agriculture the Green Revolution. But the job wasn't over. Not only did the grain quality of IR8 need improvement, then we had to start searching for sources of insect and disease tolerance. And uh, they were forthcoming, going to South in, in, mostly South India or in Sri Lanka. That led to newer semi dwarfs with better grain quality and genetic resistance to withstand pests without environmentally destructive pesticides. The greatest tribute to the work of scientists like Hank Beechel is that the time of famines gave way to bountiful harvests from the new varieties and technologies. And these uh, institutes now, the first one of the system was the International Rice Research Institute, which you organized and which you headed until you retired. And uh, now there's uh, 18 of them. There was for many years 14 and it's yeah, 13, 14, 13 and, and no, it's no, moved no. up to 18 no, now. No. But uh, also that first institute led to the establishment as a second afterthought in Mexico of the corn and wheat. Yeah. Uh, international became, Center. Became SIMIT after the pro program. And yes. it happened because of a visit of the president of Mexico who was visiting Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And at the farewell banquet, for those of us from the Rockefeller program saying we were being told goodbye mm -hmm. uh, in 1961, farewell dinner, the president stood to speak. Uh, as a thank you thing. And then he proceeded to tell about his recent visit to Southeast China, or Southeast Asia. And among the visits, places he stopped was the Philippines. Yes. And then when he was there, the president insisted that he accompany him to a place of this new Rice Research Institute. And he told us about the director there was an American by the name of Chandler, and there was tremendous activity and beautiful laboratories, but everybody working out in the paddy plots also. And he said, it's, I didn't know until I was leaving that the director said, you know, the first seeds of these kinds of programs were sown in Mexico. And I, meaning you, Bob Channel, yeah. was there. Yeah. And Lopez, President Lopez Mateo said, that being the case, I insist, even though we're saying goodbye tonight, uh, that we find <coughs> some way so that an international institute of that caliber uh, or something approaching it can be established here in Mexico on wheat and maize, where we have demonstrated that a lot of impact has been made so that we, the people of Mexico, can invite young scientists from other countries to come and train here at this international institute that will come to be, I hope, and in so doing, repay for some of the benefits that we have received from the Rockefeller Foundation Mexican government program that we're saying goodbye yeah. to tonight. I remember President Mateo Lopez, Lopez Mateo's visit very, very well. And uh, uh, I didn't realize, I didn't quite know what you just told. I didn't realize he carried it back quite that well. And he but, carried it at and the and fair let me, you, dinner. let me tell you a funny story that <coughs> happened at that when he was here. He had an entourage with him. Oh, yes. Know, several oh. people. And I was sitting by one of their ministers at luncheon, we had a luncheon for him, of course, that day, and, and uh, I was speaking to him in Spanish, in my poor Spanish, because I didn't know how much. So I, finally I said to him, uh, uh, thinking me, maybe he spoke better English than I did Spanish, so I said, uh, oh, uh, I'm English, he said, a little. And, uh, and I said, uh, 
Oh, when did, so they make conversation. I said, when did you leave Mexico? Oh, I leave there all my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so I went back to Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it's curious how all of these things unfolded, Bob, and you and I were among the pioneers that had this wonderful experience. Yeah. Caring one step farther about how that uh, comment of Lopez Mort Mateos, mm. uh, in the farewell dinner, he said, I insist we find a way. And the Mexican government will do its part to make this happen. Oh. It was four years before the papers were signed, and I have a picture that I, yeah. that I value very mm. highly, mm. where Dr. the late Dr. George Herrar uh, and President Adolfo Lopez Mateos yeah. are signing the paper. Somewhere in late 55, uh, 65 or 66 perhaps, the press got hold of the story of IRA and it became quite a thing, Green Revolution. And for a while there, here he was inundated with visitors, prime ministers, kings, queens, high potentates of all sorts and descriptions. And Chandler would announce, so-and-so is coming next week, shape it up, and, you know, white shirt and tie. And then we got the announcement, President Johnson was coming with President Marcos and their respective wives. All right, get your shirt out, put the tie on. And indeed, the two presidents came. As I say, I think it was October 66. And they came for this specific purpose of seeing this miracle rice, which is the Philippine jargon for IRA. Well, this was just before lunch, somewhere around 11 o'clock in the morning, they show up. Someone had the foresight to build a wide levee, a walking area, into the field. And that field was right in front of that circle, which was between then administration and our laboratory building. And there was a field of IRA, a plot of IRA out there, and we had this wide levee. It looked to me like the uh, aircraft carrier. I mean, this was so the great man wouldn't fall into the mud. And it was maybe three meters wide and, oh, perhaps five, six meters long. So we troop out there. And it was... First Chandler, President Marcos, Beechel, myself, and right behind me, Johnson. And we're starting to walk out of this levee, and I hear this deep southern drawl. I said, boy, I look around, he, I know he's talking to me. I look around, I said, sir. He repeats. He says, boy, he says, move over to one side. The photographers want to take my picture. Well, I was convinced in my own mind when he said, boy, the first time he's going to ask me how he's going to get out of this mess in Vietnam, or at least some question about IRA. They all know he wanted his photograph taken. So the boy moved over to one side. <laughs> there was a very famous baseball, American baseball, uh, general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers. I was a fan of the Brooklyn Dodgers when I was a little boy. That was Branch Rickey. He was a wizard. And he said, luck is the residue of design. I think he was right. Sure you're lucky. Some people are lucky, some people are not lucky. Why are some people lucky? Uh, I think it's because they've been thinking about this a lot. You know, it's Luck does appear on its own volition, I know, from time to time, but a lot of luck is, to, is the consequence of putting a lot of mental, observational evidence all together, and there's, all of a sudden it, it happens, it works. Yeah, there's luck, there's always luck, but you, sometimes you earn your luck. You influence your luck, sure. I wish I were 26 years old again. This is 
the first song that I wrote specifically about the issue of hunger. And I wrote it sometime before I had the privilege of serving with Dr. Borlaug on President Carter's Commission on World and Domestic Hunger. And yet I believe, out of what I had heard of him and the good work that he had done as the father of the Green Revolution, that uh, somehow I learned this song from him. It expresses what I believe is in the birth cry of every newborn baby, just one of the things that binds us together all over the world. And it says, I want to live. There are children raised in sorrow on a scorched and barren plain. There are children raised beneath the golden sun. There are children of the water and children of the sand. And they cry out through the universe, their voices raised as one. I want to live. I want to grow. I want to see and I want to know. I want to share what I can give. I want to be, I want to live. Have you gazed out on the ocean, seen the breaching of a whale? Have you watched the dolphins frolic in the foam? Have you heard the song the humpback hears 500 miles away, telling tales of ancient history? of passages and home. I want to live, I want to grow, I want to see and I want to know. I want to share what I can give, I want to be, I want to live. For the worker and the warrior, the lover and the liar, for the native and the wanderer in kind. For the maker and the user, the mother and her son, I am looking for my family, and all of you are mine. We are standing all together, face to face, arm in arm. We are standing on the threshold of the dream. No more hunger, no more killing. No more wasting life away. It is simply an idea, and I know it's time has come. I want to live, I want to grow, I want to see, and I want to know. I want to share what I can give, I want to be, I want to live, and I want to grow. I want to see, and I want to know. I want to share. paraphrase a small poem written by a friend of mine, David White, 
who says this is not the age of information. This is not the age of information. This is the time of loaves and fishes. People are hungry, and one good word is bread for a thousand. The lives that we honor here are words upon words that have given bread to those hungry. There's a full moon over India and Gandhi lives again. And who's to say you have to lose for someone else to win? In the eyes of all the people, look as much the same. For the first is just the last one. When you play a deadly game, it's about time we realize it. We're all in this together. It's about time we find out. It's all of us or none. It's about time we recognize it. These changes in the weather, it's about time, it's about changes, it's about time. There's a light in the Vatican window for all the world to see. And a voice cries in the wilderness, sometimes he speaks to me. I suppose I love him most of all when he kneels to kiss the man. With his lips upon our mother's breast, he makes his strongest stand. It's about time we start to see it. The earth is our only home. It's about time we start to face it. We can't make it here on our own. It's about time we start to listen to the voices in the wind. It's about time. It's about changes. It's about time. There's a man who is my brother. I just don't know his name. But I know his home and family because I know we feel the same. And it hurts me when he's hungry and when his children cry. I too am a father. That little one is mine. It's about time we begin it to turn the world around. It's about time we start to make it the dream we've always known. It's about time we start to live it the family of man. It's about time. It's about changes. It's about time. It's about peace. It's about plenty. It's about time. In Cambodia, cattle now graze where mass graves once held victims of the Khmer Rouge. Civil war continues in Cambodia, but with the help of science, rice grows again in the killing fields. The combination of violence, dislocation, and hunger means that remaining rice farming areas must be highly productive. Scientists from the International Rice Research Institute are working with farmers to help Cambodia grow enough rice to feed its people. Cambodians eat rice three times a day. Two-thirds of the calories in their diet come from rice. The rice growing environment in Cambodia is unlike what we find in countries like the Philippines and Indonesia and even Vietnam. Cambodia's rice is mainly grown under rain-fed conditions. Only 15% of the rice growing area is irrigated. And within these rain-fed conditions, the major problem is the water depth. 
Much of this area, more than half of this area, is subjected to water depths exceeding 50 centimetres at some stage of the year. So what we see here is the displacement of people from their home villages. They come from the mountains, 60 kilometres from here. They brought with them their rice seed. They've been living in these uh, little huts here. They've had nothing to eat and they've eaten their rice seed. Exactly the same sort of thing happened during the Pol Pot time. They, uh, they were displaced during the Pol Pot time, taken up to many, many kilometres, sometimes hundreds of kilometres from their hometowns. They took them with them their rice varieties, they ate their rice varieties, and many of these were lost during that period. In order to ensure that history does not repeat itself, people from the camp entrusted eerie scientists with two precious handfuls of seed. We can keep these under cold storage conditions and reintroduce them into, uh, into the environment once the, there's been a political settlement or once the farmers can return to their home villages. But when that will happen is anyone's guess. There has been talk of a settlement, but the road to peace will be rough. Rice is a very ancient crop. The history of cultivation is more than 7,000 years old. So at one time, there were more than 100,000 varieties grown on farms in so many farmers' fields, plus the wild species. But with modern plant breeding, many of these old varieties have disappeared and will continue to disappear. And the wild species are also being endangered by development and uh, human uh, neglect. But these materials are very valuable for the future improvement of rice. You know, if some of the, this week I believe there's a major meeting uh, in Europe that will give the latest projections on global warming and the rise of sea level. That could prove to be the greatest challenge of it for Erie, for plant breeding, for rice science in general because as you know, rice is, the majority of rice is found in the large, low-lying river deltas of Asia, the, the, the Ganges, the, the Brahmaputra, the Irrawaddy, the, the, the Mekong, the Godavari, all those big uh, deltas are, you know, in some cases only a few inches above sea level. I mean, so I think right now the minimum, minimum, prediction for sea level rise. I, I was reading that they're expecting, uh, and this is the most conservative projection you can make, 38 inches by the middle of this century, I believe, is the timing. 38 inches will obliterate places like Bangladesh, uh, places like West Bengal, the Mekong Delta. It, it's huge. So what will happen slowly, or maybe not so slowly, is brackish water will get pushed up the, the, the uh, rivers and affect the growth of the rice. Then you get less and less fresh water coming down because the glaciers are melting in the Himalayas uh, at, a, at a rate that people can't believe. So you're going to get you're going to get a scarcity of fresh water and then the rising sea level that pushes in the brackish water and that's going to push the cultivation of rice way back in, in a gradual or maybe not so gradual manner. So salinity tolerance might offer some help. You know there are areas of uh, the world like you go to uh, Sulawesi you could find uh, the buyer varieties that are tolerant of of brackish water and you know uh, are, are tolerant of the tides coming and going maybe building on the genetic capacity of those materials and you know identifying new sources of uh, salinity tolerance 
and, and drought tolerance may offer some hope through plant breeding and, and other contributions of other scientists. But, but I think the, the global warming and the resulting rise in sea level, uh, and remember that 38 inches is the minimum. Others are predicting more, faster, and that portends a real crisis in rice cultivation. Yeah, so Erie's, um, Erie's reaching its 50th year. I think the great challenge is whether Erie is going to persist as an institution as we've known it, or whether it's going to be transformed into something more virtual. That's how I envision the great challenges that lie ahead. The reason I say that is because I think that uh, we have a reason to hold on to much of the infrastructure that's there, but part of the inf infrastructure that's there has given way in other parts of the world and in other institutions uh, to a kind of networking approach to research. Because the expertise that we need is not often, uh, we're not able to attract the expertise necessarily into um, a given physical location for the period of time at which we need to interact. And so I see Erie's future as becoming more and more that of uh, a network of collaborators rather than um, a mortar and bricks place where you, you go and you, you, you are only Erie staff because you're there. I think that part of what I experienced during the last three years of my contract with Erie, which was I was a shuttle researcher with a responsibility to Erie, but a, a lab here at Cornell and a thought process that encompassed a larger um, perspective on how we could utilize molecular markers effectively in plant breeding. And I, when my contract ended with Erie and I became a Cornell professor, the fact that my program did not change, and in fact my loyalties never changed, suggests that there are people like me out there for whom um, an inter-institutional working relationship might be a very productive way to envision a future. I also believe that we need to hold on to the, the mortar and the bricks and the seeds that are in that gene bank, and that is a precious resource that we, really, um, that we really have to have in one place that we can actually access. That's a living resource that needs to be looked after. But a lot of the computational work, a lot of the electronic communication, even a lot of the networking and, and scientific uh, efforts that I participate in are done now in a much more um, virtual way. And I think that the Institute is looking forward to a future of um, increased movement of ideas and resources and also a very different relationship between the public and the private sector as funding um, changes, the, way, the ways in which funding happens are changing. And I think we have to reinvent our institutions. It's not just Erie that will have to reinvent itself. I think our university systems in the United States are undergoing an enforced reinvention. And I hope that maybe we can come together and think about who we train as university people or people in the international sector and how we're training the next generation of scientists and which problems we need to um, come together to address and then use a new institutional framework that includes colleagues in the private sector as well to try to address those needs. So I, I think Erie is not alone in facing these challenges. I think it's just that it would be nice to see our institutions get together and come up with something novel that would work and that would engage the world's most dedicated and brightest people and help work through some of the um, bottlenecks and some of the backlog that we've been unable to break through due to institutional barriers in the past? Well, I think uh, uh, Iris' uh, challenges have been, you know, it, as, the, as the, the national programs have become stronger, uh, Iris has uh, started putting emphasis on uh, uh, certain areas where uh, the national program, where Iris had a comparative advantage like going into uh, into molecular biology, biotechnology, uh, and uh, we stopped naming the varieties because the national programs have very, have uh, have been very, have become very strong. So we supply them the germplasm, but the challenge will continue to be for Erie to find new things, you know, which uh, which uh, can uh, help the national programs. In breeding, I think we have to 
to continue to look for the avenues for increasing the yield potential, putting new sources of identifying the new sources of disease resistance, insect resistance, so that they can be uh, can be supplied to the national programs, and also use the new technologies of uh, uh, genetic engineering. It, the, the environment for genetic uh, accepting the genetically modified crops is not as uh, as uh, good as it should be, but eventually I think in few years the the national program, the farmers and the other uh, NGOs, they will start accepting the the genetically modified material. So that's uh, uh, I think uh, where uh, there is a challenge to to incorporate those kind of techniques uh, into into rice uh, improvement, genetic engineering, the various uh, molecular biology techniques like. Uh, uh, molecular marker aided selection, uh, the identifying the QTLs for these difficult situations, uh, uh, the drought for example. So, it is challenge is to find the new technology, new uh, breeding techniques and incorporate into the, into the uh, breeding approaches with the focus in increasing the yield potential and developing varieties with the novel traits and uh, work with the national programs. Well, I think uh, the responding to the environmental challenges is going to be an important one. Uh, farmers are very capable in making adjustments in their production system in response to changes in climate if they know what they're going to be. And so Make working with farmers and keeping them informed is, is going to be an important aspect of, of uh, environmental changes. Water is going to be, of course, more and more uh, an issue. Uh, the management of the water, uh, both at the, at the flooding site is it, and uh, at the drought site, but more so at the drought site, is, is, is going to be more important. Uh, and then the whole change in the demand structure of rice, uh, where uh, rice quality is going to be more important, uh, and uh, the changes in the diets towards higher protein components, uh, higher vegetable components, is going to reduce rice um, rice demands in the future, and I think keep the rice prices from going up forever. They are high now, but I think they will be coming down. So those are, that leads to some different challenges in, in uh, rice research. Uh, I think the, the present day long term um, sort of pie in the sky or, you know, uh, put a man on the moon type of projects uh, are, are sound. But they, they must be continue to be considered as long shots and, and until they really pay off. The other aspect is the whole area of toxins. I think uh, good work has been done in IPM, uh, reducing the use of toxins. But there's, there's got to be much more of a harder-nosed uh, uh, approach to that. And uh, policy uh, guidelines need to be influenced in that area the use of toxins in production systems and st subsequent storage of materials so that uh, food, uh, the health aspects of food are, are, are captured more, more efficiently. Um, again, uh, it's, it's very hard to, to sort of pin down what should be done uh, by Erie and how Erie should be doing this in the area of human health and eco eco health. Uh, there is a very complex relationship between the impact of agriculture, uh, con the conduct of agriculture, and the effect of the health of the operators and their family, the farmers and their family. Um, that that can have impact on their ability to produce rice. I mean, their decision making is going to be affected. They, they are not going to have the energy level that if they are affected by insecticides and, and other pesticides, 
and other health challenges. So I think that that component has to be included, uh, not just the nutrition and the nutritional quality of the rice, but also consequences of the production of rice uh, on, on the health of the, of the operators, their families and the ecology. We need to have a more central role because people are going to be more demanding and more sensitive to that in the future. The subtitle of my paper is The Trouble with Your Economists. Okay. And, uh, you know, uh, sometime last February, uh, February in 2008, when the rice prices were really up and high, I was in Bob Ziegler's office and Bob said... He he's the, he's the current DG of your... He's the current DG. And uh, Bob Ziegler said, he started off the conversation. He said, the trouble with you economists, and I thought to myself, how many times have I heard that? <laughs> I, nobody ever says the trouble with you plant pathologists or the trouble with you plant breeders. It's always the trouble with you economists. So he said, the trouble with you economists is you're always thinking about the past. You're never thinking about the future. And I said, Bob, you should be lucky because the, when we think about the future, we, we project the future, we're always wrong, you know. <laughs> and so about that time, there's a guy called Nippon who came from TDRI to give a conference. Now the rice prices are way up here. And, and Nippon said, one of his yeah. presentations, he said, you know, everybody thinks the rice price is going to stay high. The World Bank thinks so, and they're always wrong, and so-and-so thinks so-and-so, like that, like that. And he said, predicting the rice price is like fortune-telling. Uh, and uh, he said, this might happen, that might happen, something like that, he said. And finally, he said, at the bottom, only God knows. <laughs> so I think we should quit. Well, and no, I don't want to quit yet, because I, I want to add something. Pursue the uh, idea Ziegler's problem, you know, the, the trouble with you economists. Yeah. Okay, so you're always looking at the best. Well, you know, in fact, when prices were high in September, October, November, December yeah. of 2008, yeah. uh, what did the economists say? Well, Randy Barker gave a seminar at Erie. Well, probably it was March or something. Anyway, yeah. April. April. So prices were sky high in April. And what Randy Barker said in April was, these high prices are not going to last, they're going to come down, just like Nippon said. Yeah. Uh, I gave a seminar and I said, these high prices of rice are not going to last, they're going to come down. But Bob Ziegler didn't want to hear that. I know. Of course not. He wanted prices to stay high, because if prices are high, it justifies more money for Erie. Uh, he's got more money anyway. So, so, uh, you know, if you focus on the past, you're wrong. If you focus on the future, you're wrong. Yeah, I know. So, uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah, the, you know, I, I had a chart where I projected the Erie budget, you know. Yeah. And that's the only projection I had. The yeah. budget was, had been going down, down like this. Right. So I projected it going like that. That's and, what happened. And that was nice, too. That was happy. Bob Ziegler was happy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he was happy. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the challenge is that the time lag between increasing the budget for a research institute uh, and any impact on productivity in farmers' fields is about a 15-year lag. And this is the problem with Gates or any of these donors. Right. They want impact. They want, they want a three-year impact, they want not impact. a 15-year impact. And, and one of the problems I have, and we didn't mention that, is about you have impact assessors now at every one of these centers. Right. And, and they're trying to assess the impact almost year to year about what has Erie accomplished this year right. and so forth like that. And, and, you know, Rome, as you said, Rome wasn't built in a day. I mean, you know, people like the Gates Foundation, they need to understand what agricultural research and stuff is about, you know, right. because it is a 15-year horizon of this stuff. 
And that's one of the, one of the major problems. I think. Well, I think that you're right. The emphasis on impact is misplaced. We need an emphasis on monitoring and evaluation. That is monitoring what's going on. Exactly. So we can understand the process. And do we believe this process will lead to technological change and will lead to impact that is beneficial to farmers? That's the question. Yeah. So are we making progress toward the goal? And in order to understand even now what the impact is, you, you have to have data and survey work right. to find out, again going back, which farmers are adopting, right. which aren't adopting, why. What's happening and, on the and, ground? And there's a big project now uh, that Gates is going to fund in Africa to do just that. I yeah. mean, we don't know much about the new rices in Africa, right. who's adopting who isn't. We need, to, we need to understand in that work that what we observe on the ground today is a result of research that was done 10, 15 years ago. So the new rices in Africa are the result of work that Monty Jones did at Warda 15 years ago. Yeah. Has nothing to do with what Gates is funding today. Yeah. And that's the process we have to understand. That's the process that President Obama has to understand when he says, we're going to start funding uh, more work on agriculture in Africa. Yeah. That, that impact will happen in the future and in the distant future.